So it's not that hard to tell, but I like the psychological horror genre. I mean, I've somehow managed to mention the Silent Hill franchise in nearly every single one of my videos so far, even if the topic has absolutely nothing to do with it. Even this one, literally just now. But I think if I were to pinpoint where this obsession with the genre came from, I'd probably have to say that it was Fran Bo. Being one of my first ever experiences getting fully into the horror genre that I can remember, coming out in August of 2015, where I would have been about 9 years old when I discovered the game and got really into horror. Now, it definitely wasn't the first horror game that I ever played. I mean, I can remember getting scared of the fog levels in Plants vs. Zombies years before this, and that gave me worse nightmares than any other horror game has ever managed to since then. But that's besides the point. Either way, the story of this video brings us to a few weeks ago, when I saw that the game was on sale and decided to buy it to see if it was as good as I remembered, and oh my god it is! Franbo is a game that I am so glad I had not fully forgotten, but had forgotten just enough to be able to experience it for practically the first time again. There were parts here and there where I just neuron activated and solved the puzzles just based on memory, but for the most part I felt as if I was playing this game for the first time all over again. And let me tell you that this game is one to be experienced for yourself. So if you can go and buy the game and play it for yourself, it has both console and mobile ports so there's nothing stopping you from playing the game if you're watching this video, I think. But either way, you should totally go and buy the game for yourself if you can, and if not, then allow me to take you on the journey through the amazing game that truly cemented my love for the psychological horror genre. And there was already a warning at the start, but this game does cover some very heavy topics, so I really suggest that if you don't want to hear about that stuff right now, then to click off, because this game gets really dark in some sections, but with that all out of the way, Let's get straight into chapter 1. Before getting into the game itself, we first get a short cutscene that provides a little bit of backstory about Franbo herself. Everything is fine. It feels like heaven. I see my parents. They look happy. They have a present for me. I wonder. It's a cat. So sweet and pretty. Dark is the deepest night. It's Mr. Midnight. My best friend. My only friend. We're having dinner and I see Aunt Grace too. I really like her a lot. It's Friday, my parents are going out. Aunt Grace takes good care of me. We're having so much fun. It's Monday night. I'm playing with Mr. Midnight. But something feels real bad. A strange creature outside my window. I don't like it. It scares me. Suddenly I hear something. It's mom, screaming. I want to know what's wrong. A bright light shines from my parents' room. I go closer. And closer. Mom? Dad? Please don't.
friend, please follow my voice. On the count of three, you will wake up. One. Two. Three. Friend, how do you feel? I'm fine, I guess. Just sad to see the same things. Sadness is something everybody has within. I really want to know who killed my parents. The police are working on it. I'll find the killer. And my cat. Your cat is missing. It would be impossible to get him back. But now I have something for you, friend. What is it? See the desk? There's a little package for you. It's from Aunt Grace. Take it. This is my mother's purse. Open it. There's something inside. Dearest friend, here's the purse you like so much. I thought you would like to have it. When I was thinking about you, I remembered that you like to examine objects and combine them with other things. So I hope you'll be able to keep this purse and give it and all the other things you find a good use. Never forget that creativity is absolutely the greatest gift you have. Love, Aunt Grace. This is just a really well-placed tutorial. This has nothing to do with the fucking lore whatsoever. She's worried about you. I'm worried too, because I'm not crazy and I'm still here. Stop it. You're out of control, young lady. Can I go to my room now? Yes, you can leave. But before you do, it's time for your new medicine. What medicine? It's called duotine, and it'll help you feel very relaxed. Nurse, we're ready. Anything new today, Dr. Dune? Nothing, actually. Same visions as before. Oh, I see. Here, friend, take your medicine. I don't feel good. Oh no, take her back to her room. And nurse, don't let her take this ever again. Beware, friend Bo. If you leave the House of Madness, I will hunt you down catch you and bring you back to insanity friend wake up the medicine will help you escape I'll be waiting for you in the forest I love you After this, we gain control fully and find ourselves in the dingy and run-down Oswald Asylum. And from Fran herself, we are told that we need to get out of here. Looking around, we find an array of objects and people which, like the rest of the game, we just figure out how they interact, combine, and affect each other in order to get closer to our goal of getting home. That <laughs> letter from Aunt Grace from before is not wrong, that is the entire game's mechanic. In this first room, we can read the clipboards of both Fran and her roommate Phil, which both describe their reasons for being in the asylum. And just like them, each child that we'll meet in the asylum has their own story and reason for being there, and it just adds a little bit more life to the game itself. Fran isn't the only one suffering here, and we will see this carry on as we travel through the asylum. But if we choose to talk to our friend Phil, he has this to say. Hello, Phil. You do know the way out, right? There are many ways out. Yes, but did you know that everything is locked? Indeed, but the office is the key. The office? What do you mean? I saw the doctor write a secret code. 
the secret code to open the yellow door? He doesn't want me to tell you. Who? Him. All doors are closed. You are a prisoner of my games. And no one will help you escape. Leave me alone, I hate you. Mom, Dad, I need you so much right now. No, I won't let that monster stop me. That friendly face is called Remor and he'll be following us throughout the entire game as its antagonist. And he means it when no one around here will help us because the only other horrible person in this place is the nurse who informs us that we'd been asleep for three days and then proceeds to be the biggest fucking bitch in the entire asylum. But once she's out of our way, we get free reign to her desk and find those pills from the opening cutscene, which now become our main mechanic for the rest of the game. After taking a pill, we are taken to this darker version of our environment where nothing is as it seemed before, and these dark creatures can be seen all around. Going down a staircase by her bed, we find Dr. Deeran talking to Aunt Grace. No, absolutely not, you can't tell her that. But she has to know. You can't keep her away from me. The reason is more than clear, Grace. No, it's not. I want to take her home now. You can't. Friend's mental condition isn't there yet. You don't understand her. She's a very special girl. We then seemingly pass out, and after solving a couple of puzzles and making a makeshift lockpick, we manage to open the door to our room and get out into the rest of the asylum or at least to a bigger part of it. We see a tall skeletal figure disappear into a portal in the floor before we're able to access a few new rooms. The first of which, being the closest one to ours, is the room of Adelaide Fugens, who was a victim of sexual abuse by someone unknown and she now suffers with auditory hallucinations and troubled thinking. However, we can also see that she really enjoys therapy through drawing, and even now we see her doing just that. After a conversation with her, she says that we can have her green crayon if she helps her with the injuries on her arm, which she implies were of her own doing after being unable to draw. We can easily solve this by giving her the band-aids that we took from the nurse's desk in our room. Coming back outside into the main hallway, it's important to note that if we take the pills in this hallway, we will see a mechanical version of Mr. Midnight, which is something that will continue throughout the rest of the game in certain areas. If we check the bathroom, after a quick jump scare, we are caught by the nurse who takes us back to our room, where we will then talk with Dr. Deeran himself, who gives us a small lecture about authority before letting us leave again, where we can now go downstairs and meet a few new characters and solve a few more puzzles. Most notably, using a piece of paper to draw the king, a castle and a horse in exchange for the walking cane behind him so that we can steal the key from this absolutely creepy shithead. I... <laughs> I could not begin to talk about how fucking creepy this dude is. However, he will then take this makeshift cane fucking hook thing from us, so we do the logical thing of pouring coffee on him and taking the key anyway. After making it into Dr. Dune's office, we find the code to the yellow door, as well as a few other totally not concerning notes, before we get shot in by none other than Phil himself, but after escaping through a vent and falling down into the basement, we go to get back up before being greeted by another cutscene and another lovely interaction with Mr. Remor. If you struggle, then you know it was I. I will be in every corner to make you suffer and cry. If you choose to disobey, your cat's life will be marked. After this, we can then exit the basement to find the absolute horrible conditions of those below us. Strange surgery rooms and stone cells reveal other patients who look like they're already dead for the most part, and after looking in one of the cells whilst under the pill, we can find the name Itward, which will come in handy later. But after returning to the regular part of the asylum, we arrive at the front desk, where we then distract the receptionist to leave before inputting the code to shut off the door's alarm and make our breakout for good, following behind us is the shithead from before. You clever little girl, do you think you can just leave? 
What? It can't be. No. I need to get to the maze. After this, we run into the maze after the mechanical Mr. Midnight and complete a short mini game before coming to the end of our first chapter. The starting section of this game is excellent at getting the player hyped up to what is to come. We've seen the horrid condition that Fran has been forced to live in, giving us the need to escape. The thrill of what Remor wants is dead for makes us want more, and all the other scattered mysteries makes us want to know what's going on here. It's also a good time to mention that the soundtrack and the environments for this game are absolutely phenomenal. It absolutely sets out what they are trying to achieve and I felt genuinely disturbed looking at some parts of the asylum, especially in the pill world. And the music track helped wonders with that. On top of it all, the world building is so well placed that in the short time that we've come to learn Fran, I already felt connected to her character and really wanted to see her get home safe and reunite with Mr. Midnight, but she still isn't home yet, so let's carry on. At the end of the maze you will find... The evil critters of the night. They will hunt you. They will laugh. But there will always be a good side. A cat full of nuts and bolts will always be your guide. Coming into the second chapter and out of the sewer tunnel, we start to get into the real weirdness of the game. Now escaped and out in the forest, we can talk to both a giant old ant and a tree covered in heads in their respective realities. The heads want the comb that has been stolen from them by a rat before they'll give us this key. And the ant tells us that he'd seen Mr. Midnight, but that he'd been eaten by his beetle pig. We are then tasked with killing said beetle pig, and we do so by finding some fruit in the ant's house, by distracting some little pinecone people and taking the berries in their house. Now it's also a good time to point out that in the woods, we can find a lot of shadowy figures wandering around, and generally things have become a lot less based in reality since, well, it's not every day that you start having full conversations with a giant ant. But after feeding the berries to the beetle pig, he stands still for long enough to allow us to split him in two with an axe that we found nearby, and out comes a rat. This isn't Mr. Midnight, but instead it's that rat that the heads on the tree were telling us about before, and sure enough, the rat lets us have the comb as long as we give them a rush first. And then we do the same with the heads in the tree, allowing us to take the key and use it on a little door that we make to fall into part two of the chapter. And strangely enough, using the pills in any part of this new area will take us all the way back to this same spot at the bottom of the well. And it really starts to make you question if any of this is real and what the pills are actually doing. And in this well, there isn't really much to do for now, so we'll come back here later. Waking up in this very bright looking house, we find ourselves in a cat bed wearing a hat which strangely looks a lot like our Mr. Midnight. Next to us is a letter which reads, Welcome home, beautiful kitten. We hope that you like your new bed. Be nice and eat your food. Love, Clara and Mia. And of course our first instinct is to completely ignore this letter and to explore. But as we do, we start to find a lot of weird objects and that the staircase that we came down at the beginning now just leads to a wall. Presumably, the little door that we made has now disappeared, and after entering the attic, we can find Mr. Midnight covered in a blanket in a cage, where we have a small reunion. Oh my goodness, it's you! I found you, my beloved friend! Friend? Is that really you? Oh dear, finally! It's me! Come closer, please, let me see you! Oh, friend, I'm so happy to see you! 
I miss you so very much. I had dreams about you. And here you are. Thank you for not giving up. I love you, my friend. I love you too, Mr. Midnight. And I really missed you. Oh, dear friend, how did you find this place? After those people took you away into the woods, I tried to follow them. But after a while, I got lost. My senses were too weak to track you. I tried to catch some food to recover, but something happened. Somebody took me and put me in this cage. Oh my dear, I'll open this cage. We need to get to Aunt Grace. Friend, I'm very tired. I wish this was all just a bad dream. I'm tired too, but at least now we can take care of each other. Friend, can I ask you something? Sure, Mr. Midnight, what is it? Did you feel my presence in our dreams? Yes, I did. You told me to take the medicine and find you. What medicine, friend? That wasn't really me talking to you. I think somebody was helping us get together. Every time I had dreams about you, I felt the presence of something else. Really? What kind of presence? From what I felt, it wasn't human. But it was very peaceful and kind. That's the real magic. It's great to have somebody else taking care of us. Friend, did you hear that? Oh, I'll see what it is. I'll try and get a key to free you. After coming downstairs, we find that the residents of the house have returned and they are not the best welcomers. Now with the task of completing this magic spell, we go around trying to find all the ingredients until we find that tall figure again. This time, he opens up the window for us and allows us to explore outside, which, unlike the rest of the house, doesn't take us to the bottom of the well in the pill world, but instead the window gets bricked up and the phrase, Doubters need the truth on paper appears, which gives us a little hint to our puzzle here. Outside, we can also find a toad who tells us that the sisters are dangerous and not to be trusted. On top of this, he tells us that the dead girl in one of the rooms became that way because she attempted to do the spell that the sisters have given us, and that we should try and find something else. Using this information, we use a board to get over a gap at the top of the well and cut down this bottle that has a note in it but not long before a larger toad jumps out of the water and eats the ball whole, resurfacing a second later, now dead. I guess eating bottles isn't a good idea after all. We use some tweezers to pick up the bottle because for some reason it is hot to the touch, and then we reveal ourselves another spell. Luckily for us, it uses the same ingredients as the first and is the one that's actually going to get us out of here. And after a little bit of trickery on the sisters, we manage to perform a spell and kill them both, turning them into ashes. After this, we use their key to open up a mirror in their bedroom and reveal quite a lot about the two. Inside of the mirror, we will find a pair of skeletons alongside a little cubby containing a photo of the two sisters in a place that looks strikingly familiar to the Oswald Asylum. Along with that, there's a bottle of duotine, which is the pills that we've been taking, and a photo of their mother stating that she must die in a two-headed baby doll but most importantly, we have a note from the two sisters themselves. Sister Promise We, Clara and Maria Bahalmut, promise to revenge the unfair destiny it would decided for us. With blood and tears, we promise that we will kill him and bring our bodies back. We won't stand this any longer. Although we are sisters, we hate each other and we always will hate each other. Nothing will ever change that. But now, with our bodies attached to each other, we can't complete our task. The strongest will live forever and the weakest will die. Once again, we see that name, Itward. Still having no idea who the name belongs to, we take the key in the mirror and use it to free Mr. Midnight. Going back outside, we feed the toad some baking soda so that he becomes big enough to carry both Fran and Mr. Midnight to the other side of the water, completing a quick game of Frogger along the way. Before he leaves, he also gives us a book, The Diary of a Man Named Leon, but we'll get to that later on. This chapter of the game really begins to build upon all those mysteries from the first. Who is Itward and what did he do to these sisters? How is Duotine connected to all of this and what does it have to do with what happens when we take the pills? This game manages to keep these types of mysteries throughout the entire runtime and it's one of its features which really make me love it. We never truly know what's going on and even Fran states at certain parts that she herself is in confusion and doesn't get it, but after taking a small walk in the woods, we come across a very unstable looking bridge before coming across a Remor once more at which he then causes us to fall down into the unknown once again, but now with Mr. Midnight by our side. Don't be afraid, friend. 
we always fall. And after the pain, we will always rise. Oh, dear Aunt Grace, don't ever leave me. Don't cry, my little girl. Your heart is pure, but your mind is tormented. You have to stay and walk your own path. Please, Aunt Grace, why won't you just take me out of here, please? You're going to leave me all alone, like my mother and father did. I'm sorry, my dear friend. You will understand soon. Aunt Grace, no, don't go, please. Friend, it's time to take your new medicine. Waking up in a place that looks nothing like the forest we just fell from, we take the control of Mr. Midnight, finding friend's clothes all over the place until figuring out that she's become a tree. And after solving a quick puzzle to get friend's purse back and getting on a boat with these two tree people, or maybe they're carrots, or fucking parsnips, I don't know, we meet the king who tells us a little bit about the land which is called a firsta, as well as the fact that friend is not supposed to be here, and that she'd open up a door which puts the land in great danger, but doesn't go into any further detail and instead sends us to the doctor of the land who will tell us more. The doctor is called Polontres and he takes us over to this floating island and gives us a little bit of backstory as to what is going on here. Good day, my name is Polontres and I'll be your doctor today, humbly at your service. Are you the emergency case? Wow, amazing. What a huge, beautiful, fluffy thing. Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, it's just I've never seen anything like you before. I'm still trying to understand that all of this is real. My name's Fran, I'm a human girl. The king sent me here to get some arms and legs. Oh, a human. I think we can get you a pair of arms and legs. But we'll have to travel a little bit further. Are you ready to enter the paws of the beast? What beast? Me, I'm the beast. Let's go. Here we are. Wow, this place is so beautiful and peaceful. I wish I could stay here forever. Thank you, this is my home. This is where I was born. The spirit of the great Velocus created it. It has the purest water in the whole universe. Oh, wow, that sounds amazing. So when do I get my arms and legs back? Oh, right, we wait until the water purifies the curse. In the meantime, we can talk. All right, who is this Velocus? You haven't heard about the five realities? He's the king of the first reality. A long time ago, he was at war with the darkness and one day he fell. He fell so badly, his heart was broken and he was all alone. But he came to Aphirsta and his blood made this water pink. That's why it's so pure. It's a very long story. While that sounds grand, I mean, I don't know about the other realities. And how is it that you're here? What brings you to Aphirsta? My kitty and I were on our way home. I was so happy to see him and hug him again, but then we fell. The big monster that follows me did this. He broke the bridge, he wants me dead. Who would like to see you dead? That sounds terrible. I prefer not to talk about this, but Sir Doctor, do you know why I became a tree? Yes, sometimes our wishes are so strong that they become true. You did this in order to keep yourself alive. Think about it this way. Your human body was destroyed, but you wanted to keep being friends, so you wanted to keep your life. So you took on this empty shell to maintain all your precious memories. This is actually the first time I've seen a human using a tree as a chrysalis. But it's dangerous to have you here. It makes our land vulnerable. I did this to myself? Wow, but Polondra say. How? I didn't know I was doing anything. You really didn't know what you were doing? I see. Well, when you travel to a first though, you open the door between your reality and ours. And with this door open, unexpected creatures can also enter our reality. And if that happens, then the balance will be tainted. And there is only one who wishes to poison the second reality. The monster. The terrible black. I can't see this happening again. 
I just can't. Don't be sad, doctor. I'm very sorry for what I did. I didn't mean to. Oh, little girl, you're so nice. You don't have anything to be sorry for. I think you're very special, but let's concentrate on your arms and legs, all right? N yes, doctor. Soldier of the sun, spirit of the water, give Fran her arms and legs. How do you feel, Fran, from a first, uh? Wow, I feel like a beautiful tree. I have leaves. I'm glad you like it. I told you we would fix it. This water is magical. It can fix anything. Anything? Do you think it could fix my mom and dad? What do you mean, fix them? What's wrong with them? Nothing, doctor. Thank you so much for helping me. You're the best doctor I've ever had, and you're so fluffy and beautiful. I had another doctor before. His name was Dr. Darren, but he was an evil old man. An old man? I bet he wasn't that bad. Maybe he was just following the rules. Let's go now. I'll leave you at the station. Now that we have our arms and legs, we can finally freely roam with Firsta. And we begin to notice that time isn't like the time in our reality. Certain areas and shops are only open during autumn and winter, but they act as if you're telling someone that you open in three hours. There's also this broken clock, which seemingly is counting the seasons instead of the time of day. We also find out about the great wizard living up on the mountain, who will help us get back home. During our walk, we also have a run-in with a few Velokas, who inform us that they are the purest of feelings and the light of all material. And right now, they are giving another Veloka a shield. One of the Velokas also tell us that in order to find the truth, our path will be immense and that we're too fragile to face the truth right now, but we're too strong to let it go. We can also come across the Wizard's Mountain, but since it isn't winter, we cannot get inside yet. Instead, we must travel to the market and find the clockmaker, who will help us fix this broken clock we came across earlier in exchange for a gold coin that we just get by beating a snail in tic-tac-toe. After fixing the clock, the clockmaker gives us a little pocket watch, which now becomes our replacement mechanic for the pills, which we have just seemingly lost. After gaining the watch, we can now travel through the different seasons and get to the wizard, who informs us that in order to get home, we need to solve four riddles in order to find the stones, which will then allow us to leave a first the. The riddles go as follows. I am as cold as I am, but if you use me, I'll be burning hard. I'm shiny as the sun, but I'll never burn you. Perhaps a sour smile I'll get you. Flow, flow, cold-blooded sun. Let your body dance through the rising stream. Light and hollow. I'm the freedom of birds and the pen of men. On top of this, the wizard tells us that he can make us human again if we can get our clothes back, which are just on the other side of the river still. Which, in order to get them, we must change the season to summer and then we'll be able to pass over the said river with a boat left behind by a fisherman. For our first riddle, we simply just have to place down a match which we already have in our inventory. For the second riddle, we must cut a hole in the basket of a barkeeper so that one of his lemons will fall out. For the third riddle, we must fix a fishing rod that we found by that boat from earlier and talk to the other shopkeepers who help us by fixing the rod in exchange for a couple of coins. We then use this rod to catch a fish in the nearby stream. But while exploring this area, we will begin to receive the first of a few hallucinations, starting with one of the Kamalas pretending to be our mother. Kamalas get explained later, but they're basically just the shadow figures that we were seeing before. They're called Kamalas. They are the opposite of Velokas. They are, they're like evil, evil things. But we find a Kamala pretending to be our mother, not long before threatening us for Remor to come after us. But after a while, we snap out of it and we continue on. And finally, for our fourth riddle, we will find Polontris in an injured state, but he will then slam onto the ground near the clock and will drop one of his feathers, which we use for the final piece. After placing all of the pieces on the right parts of the star, the wizard sends us off to go and get his hat from the mountain itself, who after talking to him explains that if we take the hat, then everyone will be put in danger, because he's not just a mountain, he's a volcano, and all of the magma inside of him will escape and destroy all of the first stuff. He also tells us that he's divorced and that his wife left him and ran off to an island. But if we can somehow convince his wife to come back and block the magma, then he'll let us have the hat. Traveling across the river, we talk to his wife and try and convince her to come back and block the magma. But she explains that he used to grow a flower for her every single year. And now that he stopped doing so, she believes that he doesn't love her anymore. And also that he's grown colder and not as warm as when she first fell in love with him. However, if we find this flower and bring it to her, then she'll agree to come back to him, 
and after bringing her back, we get the hat and we take it to the wizard, who then sends us off to the library to fetch him a special book, where upon arriving at the castle we get the second of these hallucinations, where we see a second friend jumping off of a wooden balcony, beckoning for us to do the same. And it's at this point where we start to see this really taking a toll on Fran, as she begins to break down, questioning whether or not she truly is crazy. But after giving the guard to the library a secret password and getting in, we can solve a simple puzzle by using a Fibonacci sequence in the language of the Aberstons. And out comes a small doll with the same likeness to the skeletal figure from before. And after grabbing the book, we bring it to the wizard, who now sends us off to grab the shoes from a dancer, whereas he sends us off quite a bit. We can only presume that the dancer is going to be at the bar, but we can't currently get in there because we don't have a ticket. So we do the logical option of sending Mr. Midnight in through the gap in the wall to steal someone else's ticket. But after the guard tells us that the handwriting clearly doesn't belong to us and that he's already let someone in with that ticket, we just use our crayon to draw on the exterminator ticket that we grabbed all the way back at the giant ant's house to make our own ticket, which the guard then admires our intelligence and lets us in, where we can now talk to the dancer, who tells us that the only way that we'll be getting the shoes off of him is by stealing them from him when he's passed out. So we set the self-playing piano to the highest speed and watch him trip over his own feet, allowing us to take his shoes. Now all that's left is to get the wizard his wand, which is just by simply moving around a couple of levers on the big Veloka statue and then it, we, we get the wand. It's like this is the easiest puzzle to solve out of this whole entire chapter. But by far all of the other puzzles in this section have been my favorites in the entire game. And even for a couple of them, I had to search up the answers because I was just truly stumped at what to do. But after giving the wizard his wands, he explains to us that he can give us the stones, but we'll have to be the one to unlock the door itself, and then proceeds to make us human again. We then travel over to the castle where we see our final hallucination for this area, where we see another version of Fran who talks of Mr. Midnight being a traitor before gunning him. Which obviously makes Fran extremely distraught and she begins to cry and claim to the king that she's crazy and that the doctors were right about her. But after a short heartfelt moment with the king and Mr. Midnight, leaving us with the message that if you can still love, then you are still alive. Before we then meet up with the wizard who places the stones, which we then form into a star that opens said door and allows us to leave a first star. But not before we are warned that in this tunnel between worlds, there are monsters that will try to kill us and that we must run away from them. This is referring to a side-scrolling minigame where we have to run away from this big troll and through another door to the end of this chapter and to the start of chapter 4. Coming out of a door we find ourselves on the other side of the fallen bridge and after trying to grab our bottle of pills it's yoinked away from us on a string and after continuing to follow it we get trapped in a rope trap which we can just easily get out of by using our knife. And out from behind the bushes comes the figure who we've been seeing throughout the entire game and he reveals himself to be the it word we'd been hearing about and that he is also the creature of the night and that we'd been playing together and that he'd helped us reunite with Mr. Midnight. We then talk about the sisters from before. He asks Fran if he recognizes him from when she was younger and he used to read her stories and states, don't you recognize me, Fran? The tall man with the long hair. I always came by night and told you stories when you were just a little baby. I came to you after you imagined me. But I'm not imaginary, you see. I'm part of your reality. Did I imagine you? You look quite familiar. Yes, I can't deny it. I exist because you exist. The truth is that you were able to imagine me because I already existed. Anyway, we don't have time to talk about this right now. I'm actually here to take you home. Follow me. We're then taken over to Itwood's flying machine, which he then explains to us that we're in the second reality before sending us off to go get some water and fireberries for the fuel for the machine. We do so by using a bucket gifted to us by Itwood himself, who also tells us that the Kamalas hate water before handing us our pills. If we ask the head dangling from a tree, much like the one that we saw before, to get us some water for the bucket because it has long hair and the water is too far down for us to reach, we can then use that on the fireberries by climbing up on a moose carcass not long after meeting a, a deedle worm, who at first thought that we were trying to take the carcass for ourselves. But after bringing the berries and the water back to Itward, we set off in the machine, and he lets us know that we're on our way to the third reality, which is our home reality. 
He then gives us a little conversation about time, explaining why it works differently in different realities, and that if we didn't have time as a concept, then we would just explode because everything would all happen at once. He also tells us that the answers to Fran's curiosity and the questions and mysteries that we all have will come to her when she finds them. He then tells us that we have to go do some maintenance works on the machine, and we must do so by using a little bit of chemistry and finding a few missing pipes in Pill World. There's also this secondary machine that we just fix by wrapping tape around one of the pipes and then adding in some water and then setting this other part ablaze with a match. However, before we go back to Itward, we can choose to investigate and explore the machine instead, finding the two sisters from before. And if we take the key from them and use it on this little theater looking thing, we get a little bit more backstory about the two sisters. In a world made of darkness and light, two little sisters tried to steal each other's charm, but neither side could decide if what they were was just right. Mia was angry and Clara was sad. And this was because they both were mad. Oh, insane little girls. Inside of their minds. Itward, the creature of the night. He always came around in dreams or reality. Teaching the girls the splendor of duality. But they couldn't understand. It would was a friend. It would was the link between darkness and light. He was gray. But Clara and Mia one day decided to get rid of Itward once and for all. Die, creature of the night, die, they said. But they killed each other instead. Dead and gone. The sisters kept complaining about each other. It's all your fault, Clara. It's all your fault, Mia. Then Itwood came to visit for the last time. And he said, You are both trapped. In a world of disconnections. But I'll give you a chance. The world has been mean to you. They sewed your bodies together to prove that they could. They gave you a mirror to compare yourselves. I'll give you nothing but what you already have and just one tiny little chance. To understand the purpose of life. But the clock is ticking. You have until the day a black cat goes missing. And the well's magic door is unlocked. The end. This cutscene explains how Fran's arrival at the sister's house was planned by Itwood, and it just adds more mystery to what Itwood's true intentions are and what Fran has to do with all of this, and what makes her so special. But after fixing the machine, we return to Itwood, who explains to us that there's this rabbit that scares him, and he wants us to go and check it out, leading us to the room and allowing us to get close to the rabbit before grabbing Mr. Midnight and shutting us in, where we are now tasked with escaping back out to the rest of the machine by repowering this elevator and using Pill World to find the combination to the hatch which leads back to the rest of mach the machine. Where it turns out that it would have Mr. Midnight just wanted to surprise us for our birthday, which by the way, it's fucking Fran's birthday. 
and it would give us some more information about what's going on and answer some more of the confusing questions and all of this. Surprise friend, happy birthday. Oh, a birthday party. I thought you wanted to kill Mr. Midnight. We lied in order to divert your attention to another direction. I'm very sorry I had to fool you, my friend. We wanted to surprise you, my dear friend. Come and eat cake. All right, thank you. You really surprised me. Thank you, Itwood, sir. The cake is made of all your favorite ingredients. Mr. Midnight told me which ones. And we have something very special from you, from all the members of the ship. That means all of us naturally born or handmade beings. Here you go. I hope you find it educational. Wow, I love the wrapping. Can I open it now, please? Yes, go ahead, open it. Wow, a cat doll. Thank you so much, I love it, it's beautiful. It may give your eyes a new perception, you know? Like the ultra reality. Is that what happens when I take the red pill, sir? Is the ultra reality what I see? Well, it depends. Would you like an explanation? Yes, please. Look for it. What you've seen is a mixture of different realities, and the ultra reality is like an invisible room where everything exists all at the same time. For example, at this exact coordinates, we are having a birthday party. But in the ultra reality, other things are happening all the time, slower, faster, or even invisible to the human eye. Because of time, humans can define past, present, or future. It gives humans a chance to understand their environment. You have a different perception of the environment, it's not linked to definitions. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not sure, sir, but I feel a little bit dizzy. That may be the ship going up and down. Lo and the candles now, dear, are about to reach our destination. You mean we're about to go home? Did you hear that? Yes, we're about to arrive. Really, how exciting. The machine's alarm goes off before we can be told anything else and we're informed that a Kamala is attacking the machine and that we need to go deal with it before it can do any serious damage. And we do so by chasing it around the ship and hitting it with the water and eventually we get it off. However, not before it managed to do enough damage to send the ship crashing down. And the ship kept going down until it crashed. Everything was destroyed. The end. But that's a very sad ending, Edward. Tell me another story, please. All right, this is a story of friend Bo and me. When she promised never to forget me or about the magic of everything. I promise it, word. I'll never forget you. Good, now it's time to sleep. Expect me in your dreams, my friend. Waking up in the middle of the woods, we see that we happen to land nearby our home street, and after a quick walk, we make it back home, only to find that the door is locked and the key under the flower pot has already been taken by Fran herself. However, we instead send Mr. Midnight inside, but before he can come and open the door for us, Dr. Darren shows up and explains that he'd been looking for us ever since we escaped from the asylum, and that he came to tell our Aunt Grace something and asks us why we were outside our house. But after explaining to him that Mr. Midnight is inside, he doesn't believe us and brings us into his car. During this cutscene, we learn some things about Dr. Dern and that he really did have our best interest in mind. We tell him about what's happened in the other chapters of the game, and he shows us some documents, which tell us more about the death of Fran and her parents. Family murder on Hayes Street. The bodies were perfectly sliced. Martin and Lucia Bo Dagenhard were found earlier this week br brutally murdered in their residence on Hay Street. The investigating police officer, Marco Holmer, said, It seems that the bodies were perfectly sliced, which would cause a quick, instantaneous death. Also, there were no signs of a struggle in the house, so the victims must have been caught completely by surprise and were unable to fight back. The police interrogated Grace Dagenhart, Lucia's twin sister, but the police didn't find any useful information. The youngest in the family, Fran Bo, was found in the woods one day after her parents' murder. She froze to death. He then gives us some extra backstory about the pills that we've been taking. But I'm not dead, sir. This is all lies. I see that. I also found out that your medicine was switched. You were given a new variant of duotine. When I looked at it in the laboratory, the levels of- I'm not even gonna pronounce that- were too high. 
That can't be good. I'm not gonna pronounce that. Creates a door between the conscious and the subconscious mind. The problem is, if the Exoplamatin. is too high, it creates a door between the conscious and the unconscious. After coming up to a graveyard, we go and visit Fran and her parents' graves and are tasked by Dr. Dern to get some shovels so that we can dig up the coffins. Going to the right, we find a storage closet which is guarded by one of those pinecone people from before, who say that if we give them some lever, then we'll let them inside. And after using the lever from Dr. Dern's car, we give it to them and inside we find nothing. Walking back to the graves, we find Dr. Dern already there, who had been successful in finding some shovels which we then used to dig up the graves. And then the, we use a crowbar that we took from the car as well to open up the coffins. Fran isn't in her grave, and instead we find the body of a dead cat, which Dr. Dune believes to be the missing Mr. Midnight, which opens up more questions as to who the Mr. Midnight we've been seeing really is, and also how did the news of Fran being dead get spread about, but we don't really have long to think about that before Remor returns once more. Vanished into the hands of darkness. You have no manners, I'm not afraid of you anymore. I've taken away from you the light. The one you love, the one you respect. And the one you desire to love you. You broken little girl. The house of madness invites you inside. If you want to find those you love, in darkness you must wake up. Wake up now, friend. Wake up. Waking up into our final chapter, we appear to be in Fran's bedroom in her house, chained to her bed with her Aunt Grace standing next to her. In this cutscene, we get implied that Fran may have been involved in the death of her parents, but we aren't told too much about it yet, only that Mr. Midnight might have been blamed for what happened. Not long after she leaves, we use the power of time to travel back to Fran when she was younger in the asylum and we then gain control of this younger friend and grab a box of keys that we then use to free the modern friend. During this time, we learn that this version of Fran does not know about Mr. Midnight and adds even more questions to what is real and not real in this story. However, we do find a drawing of Itwood and Polontris, so we know that this younger friend does know about them. But coming back to the present, we read a note which gives us the code to open up a box given to us by Polontris, and inside we find a note detailing on how to build an ego clock as well as a chunk of text reading Mabuka Mabuka, wake up Mother Mabuka The horned child is playing with the light, the Velocus is angry and shining too bright Mother Mabuka, wake up, wake up, and give up the child before the darkness ends In the hands of the light, Mabuka must wake up Let's build the ecog clock on the back of the giant cat Too strong are the bubbles, and too bright is the light, she cried Me, Mabuka, the mother of darkness, will open my heart Please take my little horned evil child and shut down the lights as well as this, we also get a key from the box, which if we use on that plush of Mr. Midnight, which it would gave us, it creates a door that allows us to leave the room. It reveals a room containing five different doors, each locked and needing their own separate keys. The first of which can be found on a table, also in this room, which leads to door 105. And what's inside, we can find three skeletal heads. Interacting with one of them, we learn that things in this world are very different to the morals of the real world, with the skeletal head saying that the laughter of children is like torment to them. We also find out that in order to get another key, we need to pry it from the second skeletal head. In this area, we can also find clothing very similar to Itward's, 
And to the left of this area, we find Bath Boy, who we take another ingredient for the clock from. And going back and taking a look at the pocket of it was clothes, we found a note telling us that there is a key in the little dollhouse in Fran's room. And sure enough, if we go back and use a knife to cut open that part of the wallpaper, we get our second key and we use that to open door 104, inside of which we find Akula, who sees everything and tells us that Mr. Midnight is locked away in another cage in Mabuka's underground. We then tell Akula that we're not afraid of Mabuka and realizing our bravery, they allow us to wander freely. Where we can find a few more ingredients for the clock, pulling on a curtain reveals a photo leading us back to that previously blocked up island that we found behind Bath Boy. In this area, we can also find a bottle, which we can fill up using the faucet next to Bath Boy. As well as this, we can also use it to fill up some balloons, which we can throw at the Kamala, which is attacking a tree outside of Fran's bedroom window. After which, the tree will give us one of our branches, which will come in use later. However, what we do now is we use the knife to cut off the big pink button from one of our dresses and slot it into a machine, which, unlike the fact that it has a fucking key on it, it doesn't give us a key, it instead gives us a pair of pliers, which we then use to open up that skeletal head's mouth and take the key to room 102. Inside of which we find a giant cat who looks shockingly like Mr. Midnight, who gives us the final ingredients to make the ECOG clock, which we then make by shoving all the ingredients into the back of the cat. After getting the clock, we go up an elevator and find another one of those heads that are attached to the trees. However, this time it has a more fiery theme and we ask it if it wants us to brush their hair because it would just be a nice experience. And after it agrees and we brush its hair, it flies away just like the ones before it, which allows us to grab the key that was behind it and open up the final door to room 103, inside of which we meet with Mabuka herself. However, she's asleep right now and we are instead greeted by this very unwelcoming tree. However, ignoring the tree, we choose to wake up Mother Mabuka using the ECOG clock. We then explain to her that Remor is the one who brought us here, and she asks us if we have consumed any kind of red bean or potion, to which we explain to her that our pills kind of look like red beans. She then states that because we've taken these pills that she cannot harm us, but that the power has been unleashed. which already begins to open up even more mysteries, but she continues by explaining that the great Velocus of Primeve said that we've been selected by the five realms of the essential existence to become the keeper of the key, and that we would be hunted down by Remor after feeding from the Red Seed. However, she then states that we are too young to be the keeper of the key, and gives us this little speech. I think Remor killed my parents, Mother Mabuka, can you imagine how that feels? I'm all of those feelings, friend Bo. I am everything sinister, all the darkness you can imagine. I feed from tears and sorrow, from desperation and fear. Then you don't care if Remor killed my parents? I thought you were nice. I'm curious to know the reason if that makes you feel better. Now I understand, it's the reason itself, the truth you are seeking. Go on, Keeper of the Key. Be brave now. I'll open my heart for you. Entering the heart of Mabuka, we arrive in a waiting room where we find Vida Nurse from all the way back at the beginning of the game. She tells us to take a number and wait no matter how much we try to explain to her that there's nothing wrong with us. Walking into the other room, we see a group of people who state how long they'd been in the room and that it would just be faster to be treated if they actually just became doctors themselves, but they're too sick to do so. After talking to each one of them, we find out that one is willing to trade places with us if we figure out what's wrong with him. And we do so by traveling back to Okula, who tells us to cry into a bottle and give it to him. After doing so, we swap numbers and go back to the nurse, who then states that we can't go into room 106 without an appointment. So then we backtrack once again to the room with the three skeletal heads and put in the nurse's number and make an appointment. And now we can finally enter room 106. You haven't chosen to end your life yet? Isn't the pain you feel enough? You're a Remor, aren't you? I haven't had the chance to introduce myself properly. Sadly, I cannot be in the third reality for long periods of time. I am Remor, the terrible black, prince of darkness. I know who you are. Don't try and act like nothing happened. Did you kill my parents? Where is my cat? What did you do with Dr. Dearn? I immensely enjoy seeing your suffering dripping from your eyes. I feed from it. You are the manifestation of my desires. I can use you for whatever I want. You are under my power. That's not true, not anymore. 
I won't allow you to trick me anymore. Tell me, why did you kill my parents? Why? You're assuming that I was the one that did such a terrible thing? I saw you that night outside my window, it must be you who did it. You trust your eyes too much. Haven't you learned that human receptors are weak? Your body is fragile, easy to corrupt. No, it can't be. Stop it. I didn't do it. I did it. It wasn't me. Stop it, please. Who was it? Who killed your parents? The dull little critter must suffer and die before becoming a star. I didn't kill my parents. I didn't. That monster wants to trick me, I know it. Everyone is crazy around here, I have to find Kitty and leave. So from what we learn, Fran did kill her parents, just while she was under the possession of Remor. But we're still not out of this yet. Walking into the final room, we discover a caged Mr. Midnight who can no longer speak to us, and Dr. Dern tied up to an electric chair. If we use a nearby syringe on him, he'll wake up and question what's going on. Before Mr. Oswald him fucking self and Aunt Grace come out of nowhere and we get this final cutscene. But what is she doing here? I thought you chained her up. I did. I told you she was a hard one to tame. Do you want me to get rid of her? Get rid of me? Aunt Grace, why are you talking like that? Who is this old man? How lovely, you sound just like your mother when she was young. My mother? Do you know her? Who are you? I'm Dr. Oswald Harrison. I know everything about you, Fran. Oswald? From Oswald Asylum? Yes, Fran. The same old man. Why do you know about my mother and my aunt? Well, many years ago, I was studying the magnificent complexity of twin siblings. Lucia and Grace were a part of my study. Both helped me to find the key to the success. Do you know what my mother and father were murdered? Yes, of course. Remo did a great job. His power of manipulation is extraordinary. What I don't understand is how you can be so calm about it. It was you holding that knife, after all. I'm not calm, sir. I knew it was Remo all the time, but why is he hurting me? Remo is a manifestation of your weakness. A blind and powerful manifestation of your fears. But why would the monster kill my parents? Because your parents were interfering with my work. But I actually did you a favor. You are suffering. And pain is connected to growth and strength, friend. Oswald, please. Let's just do what we have to. Aunt Grace, please don't be mad at me. We're family. Let us go. My kitty and I can find a place to go without bothering you. Please just let us go. Yes, you're right, friend. I'm sorry for being so hard on you. Come on, let's go now. Friend, my dear. Listen to me. You must know, Dr. Oswald only wants what's best for you. When Lucia was pregnant with you, he knew you'd be a very special girl. He told us to take good care of you, but your mother betrayed us. She wanted to hide you from us. She thought we wanted to kill you, but that's not true. Dr. Oswald really wants to give you the best, but for that you must allow him to try a little experiment on you. And then everything will be fine? Of course, but there's still one thing we must take care of. The little traitor must go. Come on, friend, stop weeping. The cat is dead now. But he was my friend, you killed my best friend. You also helped kill my parents, didn't you? Didn't you? How can you live with yourself? I hate you! Stop it, friend.
Don't you dare touch Grace, you little monster. Oh my goodness. She's totally insane. Bring her to me. I'll do the experiment while she's still warm. I need to extract the brain right away. Fran? Are you alright? What have you done to her? She tried to kill me. You were right about Fran, Dr. Darren. She was sick. But she's bleeding. Let me take care of her. No, you won't. She's not mine now. I've been waiting for this moment for many years, looking for the right child, the right brain. Now if I have her, nothing can stop me. Oh, friend, everything will be fine. Who, who are you? I'm Itward, the one many children talk about. But you're not human. Yeah, I'm not pronouncing that. Itward, I found him. Oh my goodness, stay away from the girl, leave her alone. Little friend must be cured. Do you think you can use the same body? Yes, she's not completely gone yet. Here I go. Oh, Mother Mabuka, you took the child's innocence. Fran is now dead and alive. Wake up in darkness, Fran, and you'll be able to walk towards light. What happened? It would, Palindras? My heart hurts. Mr. Midnight? You're alive, my kitty. I missed you so much. Please tell me something. Fran, we must go now. Go? Alright. Dr. Dear, look, this is Edward and Palindras. I told you about them, remember? I told you they were real C. Do you believe me now? He can't hear you. I think he's under the power of Mabuka now. We really must leave, now. But can he come with us, please? He's been really nice to me. He really wants to protect me and help me. We can't bring him with us, I'm sorry. But what we can do is make him believe that this was all a dream. He'll wake up and think none of this really happened. But he won't remember you, Fran. I see. Well, that's okay, I guess, as long as he's safe. That's very kind. You're finally seeing beyond your own desires. You're becoming one with everything. Your parents would be very proud of you. You really think so? Thank you, Polontris. Now let's send Dr. Dern home. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not fucking pronouncing that. Goodbye, Dr. Dern. Let's go now, friend. There's so much you must see and learn. That sounds like fun. Let's go, kitty. I still don't know many things. But one thing I do know. That between guilt and fear, I chose happiness. So before I start this segment, I want to state that I'm not going to be going too in-depth because like I said before, the script is already way too long as it is. Normally my videos are only about 20 minutes long. It is rare for me to make a video this long. But starting off the segment by saying that every single environment in both the normal reality and the ultra reality look absolutely amazing. The amount of details and references to other parts of the game and lore is phenomenal and accompanied with it is an insanely good soundtrack that I fully implore you go and listen to. On top of this, there is still a lot of the game that I skipped over for time constraint and also to once again not make the script any longer than it already is, especially with the puzzles. So I heavily suggest you go and play the game for yourself. 
It's an incredibly good game and it's one that will be with me for a long fucking time and already has been with me for a long time. All of the lore, world building and characters are so well built into the world and environment that surround them that not once did I feel like anything was out of place for as weird of a game that it is at times. Nothing ever felt like padding or that the gameplay was boring. For the entirety of the game's runtime, I felt engaged in its puzzles and story building. Whilst playing the game, I always felt like I wanted more, but the ending was timed well enough that the game didn't begin to drag on. The characters were layered well and never felt too flat, and overall I feel like everything in the game fit with the rest of it and kept me entertained throughout its whole runtime. And like I said at the start of the video, I'm so glad that I forgot enough about this game to feel as if I was playing it for the first time again. This game is a really great experience and I'm so glad to have been able to talk about it because there is a reason that this game spawned my love for the psychological horror genre. There are not so many little hints that tap into the psychological part that I haven't even gone over in this video. But <laughs> I can tell you that whilst playing this game I had to pause every five minutes to nerd out about a tiny little psychological feature. But the game, the game is just so heavily detailed and I'm genuinely so glad that I got to play it again and talk about it to you guys. This game really means a lot to me and I'm really happy that I got to play it again. But that will be all for today. Thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you made it to the end because of how long this video is going to be. And if you liked it, then I suggest sticking around by subscribing. I make videos like this one all the time, but not of this length, but you get the gist. So if you like this one, then make sure not to miss my other uploads. You can also find me live over on my Twitch and more frequently on my Discord server. So if you want to suggest games, topics, creepypastas, etc, whatever you want me to talk about next, then make sure to let me know about it. Once again, thank you so much for watching and bye bye